perhaps our elder statesman, scholar, he is our activist scholar, he is our teacher, and he certainly has the ear and heart of the entire national and international African community. I think it's important to mention that he has written his book, which I consider I have almost read it twice now. I have to go over it and over it, African World Revolution. It is almost a very practical recipe of understanding of all of the comp all of the questions that prior to this book appeared to be complicated. I mean, he just simply addresses just every question <laughs> that the African community could have raised, I suspect, over the last uh, 40 years. And you certainly have to have uh, African World Revolution by John Henry Clark, and if you don't, you know, I see it on every, t every table out there, so you certainly got to get it. But Dr. Clark, is internationally renowned, and I don't have to tell you that. And we're certainly privileged to have him with us here in this fall. Uh, Dr. Kyle Clark. in a strange way completes itself. Two Alabamians, one white, one black, both from poor sharecropper background, debating a paramount issue of race, debating about a subject that was really an invention because nature created no races. Not only the word itself is artificial, but the tragedy around it is artificial. Now, if I say the tragedy is artificial, I cannot say the pain and the murder is artificial. You felt that. And that's real. I am saying, around a word that was totally unnecessary and a situation that was invented, not only have people suffered, but the inventor has suffered misconceptions and the inventor have cheated his own children out of the truth about history and the truth about how different people must relate to each other if we're going to have a world where man will walk with right. some kind of peace right. and some kind of dignity. Right. We keep calling for black history when really history has no color we need to call for honest history right. for all of the people of the earth. Right. I do not believe in the concept of curricular inclusion. Because if you include me into a curricula that is wrong, it is like pouring clean water in a dirty, into a dirty glass. That's right. That's right. I believe in corrective history. I believe in honest history. And you don't have to take white people out of history to put black people into history. Mm -hmm. But put them in, in their right place. I think the achievement 
of the Iceman inheritance as a book is not that it is a great masterpiece of literature, but that it is a revelation coming from the side to the victims. And it is a revelation for both sides, saying things that we both must know, a situation we both must confront if we are going to end the cycle of murder so that both of us can walk in peace. And if we as a people who've been the victims cannot arrive at a point where we can say the murder stops right here. We cannot come to power and form a black branch of the Ku Klux Klan. We cannot waste our time developing theories of race when the concept of race is a myth. We cannot go into religions and use them as a rationale for excluding other people or oppressing other people when all organized Western religions are male chauvinist murder cults. All organized Western religions have made God ungodly. Anybody that says his God gives you the right to enslave another people have made God ungodly. That's right. That's right. And anybody who says that his God chose him over other people have made God into a bigot. Yes. Yeah. If yeah. God is love, God does not choose one people over another. Now my complication around the concept of race and color began as a Baptist Sunday school teacher when I wanted to teach school, teach Sunday school at an early age. And so therefore I had to read the Bible, pronounce words like Deuteronomy, <laughs> and I did. And then when I had to go through these little tracks, little fold out Sunday school lessons sent from a white Baptist publishing company in Tennessee. And when I looked at all of those angels, all white, and I had a great grandmother who told me God was love, God was no respect of gift and gift. And he is the father of us all. It was those angels that confused me. <laughs> all the people that died, not one little brown or black angel sneaked into heaven. <laughs> I began to understand something had gone wrong with God's book. Somebody had tampered with God's book. Yeah. All right, right, all right. <laughs> Misuses were being made of the Holy Book. Where am I? I look in the book, I see Moses born in Africa. <laughs> Going down to eat to Ethiopia to marry Zipporah. Moses gets white, Zipporah gets white. <laughs> I see people going to the land of Punt, which is present-day Somalia, they get what? <laughs> people going to Kush, the present-day Sudan, where I found blue black people today, and they get what? I couldn't find any black people in Africa, and the Bible unfolding in Africa. I couldn't even find any black people. I'm confused now. <laughs> about all of it, and I'm in Georgia 
teenager, I'm mowing lawn, airing dogs, and doing all kind of chores to keep body and soul together before school and after school. <coughs> I'm being pushed off the sidewalk by white thugs. And one time I almost pushed off a bridge. In the meantime, I'm being told that this is superior people. Now, why does superior people need to prey on a lonely, straggly, delivery boy, lawnmower, kid ain't bothering nobody, trying to make a buck. Here's shining white people's shoes, polishing all those buttons and all the officers' clothing. You're trying to keep it together. I mean, well, what would you, you got to pray on it. You, you sure can't be brave when you got to take six of you and want to pray on him. So why is the bravery? Why is the superiority? I'm going to suspect something. <laughs> Free and selfishness. Free and selfishness. Now I'm working in their homes. <laughs> Mowing their lawn, washing their windows. And sometime after the man of the house is gone, I sit down, the lady of the house calls me in, I finish my chores, and I sit there and she complains, she sit there, she wants somebody to talk to her, she's just complaining about her husband, not a single thing in the world I can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, but she'd rather have some boy with more in the lawn to listen to nobody to listen at all. Mm -hmm. So once I listen, I go out and mow the lawn. So I'm working for rich white people who have good libraries that they never use. <laughs> so when I begin to borrow books and they never miss them, I start bringing them back. <laughs> I'm getting a decent education while trying to survive. I began to a habit of picking up leaflets out of the street, put them in my pocket, I read it later. So I get to my desk in school, start putting out my leaflets I picked up. One fella grabbed the leaf and take it to the teacher. The teacher Shakes her head, oh, John, you're such a good boy. Why would you do a silly thing like this? I'm ashamed. I have to report this to the principal. I don't know what the hell this is all about. <laughs> I take it to the principal. The principal shakes his head. So I thought you were the finest young man in this school. Why would you do a thing like this? I don't know what they're talking about. Finally, he hands me the leaflet. I had had time to read it. The leaflet says, Niggas read and run, the Ku Klux Klan rise again. <laughs> In my innocence to learn how to read, I'm picking up things out of the street because I never had a book in my house other than the Bible. I had picked up an advertisement of the group for the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> But I continue to read and continue to search. And when I want to impress the teacher, I asked the white man that I worked for for a book on African people in history. And he said, in our vernacular, he let me down slow. He said, John, you came from a people who have no history. He said, well, one day you will have history. One day you might be a great Negro like Booker T. Washington. <laughs> I didn't know anything about Booker T. Washington. Then, 20 years later, before I investigated him, finally I read an essay called The Negro Digs Up His Past. And I knew that we not only had a history, but in ancient history, we were older than our oppressors. We were older than slavery. And when I discovered how old I was, I would walk up that but white, white people said, mm, you just got here. 
<laughs> young people. <laughs> now, as they once said in early black vaudeville, I said that to say this. <laughs> but we need to look at, not to demean anyone, but to put things in proper perspectives, is that the conquest of the mind, the propaganda of superiority based on color, the propaganda of bravery based on John Wayne and a thousand heroes riding into the sun, one of the greatest achievements of European people that they captured the mind of other people and their victim never asked any question. Have you ever seen one lone white man lynch one lone black man? All right, come on now, come on. They don't come by one, they don't come by two. <laughs> Have you ever seen it done without a gun? Have you ever seen the odds even? <laughs> we have not asked the question about the bravery of people who Hollywood has made brave. We see one man killing 25 Indians and chasing them away. Have you ever seen one man meet one healthy Indian with no gun? I know. <laughs> we are at fault in some ways because we haven't asked the right question and to get the right answers for all of this. Have we ever looked deep enough into our history to understand that over half of human history was over before anyone knew that a European was in the world. That's right, that's right, that's right. Now how did you manage all those years having built enduring societies, not only without a jail system, but without a word in your language that meant jail? All right. And how then, if you achieved that, and there is proof that you did, how did you ever become inferior to those who have achieved nothing resembling this in their humanity? Why then have you not studied the structure of our family to understand that Africa without farmers had a family structure that in itself was a mini industry, in itself had a built-in Supreme Court, and that for 3,000 years that family structure has been under siege and it still is. The conqueror must always destroy those things that make you feel good about yourself. Tell the truth, man. Tell the truth. And you, because the conqueror came, laughed at your gods, you adopted his god. Laughed at your clothes, you adopted his clothes. And sometimes, laughed at his women, and you lust after his women. The conquest of the mind was his greatest conquest. Why then that this juvenile delinquent from a thought out icebox in Europe <laughs> take over the world? Why didn't you fake it out? 
You had a humanity in your culture that made you hospitable to strangers and you never studied this stranger. You didn't know him then, you don't know him now. Savings and loans, well. gut encounters. Now they've dismantled a system, no matter how bad communism was or my head, how bad you think it was. Everybody in it had something to eat. Everybody in it had a had an apartment, though it may not have been the shiniest one, but it was out of the rain. Yeah. All right. All right. Now they're going to change that for a system of privatization, but they're going to have homelessness. Yeah. Tell it, man. Come on. Come on. Communism did not fail. The communists failed. Yeah. Now what's this got to do with the subject of the evening? It's got something to do with the subject of the fact that when a European takes over anything, a religion or a political order, he must exploit it for his own use or he must destroy it. Greed and selfishness. Greed and selfishness. <laughs> Nothing has been in peace. And when he come into your home, you assume because you transfer your humanity to him, you assume that he's got the same humanity as you. And you are not asked and you should have, what is your mission in visiting my house? And if the enemy is at my door, will you be loyal to me or loyal to my enemy? Let's get this straight before we start anything else. But instead of getting to the asking these questions, you invite him for dinner. Your mentality had never adjusted to dealing with a people who you can invite for dinner, who will rape the cook and enslave the hosts. You had never dealt with a people who will use religion as a handmaiden for enslavement. Now when I say that the African gave the world no religion, I say it with pride. Because what the African had was higher than religion. It was spirituality. Foreigners yeah. codified that spirituality, formulized it, dogmatized it, and turn one against the other, then turn to their gods to justify the enslavement of people outside of the religion. Mm -hmm. Out of this formation came the chosen people men. <laughs> and out of it came the true faith men. Mm -hmm. If you got the true faith, that means all other faith are false. And if that wasn't enough, after the Romans disgraced themselves in the mismanagement of Christianity that was against that temperament in the first place, they opened the door to Islam. Now they said that their God said it's all right to enslave anyone outside of the faith. I wish one day one black person at least some of the black scholars who are Muslim would read some of the literature about this religion. Stop jiving. This is the black man's real religion. Real quick. That you had no religion until the 7th century AD. 
This is that, that true religion. Mm. I ain't got nothing against you. Join anything you want to. Because <laughs> buddy didn't do everything that touches your life. Waste your time and your money must become an instrument of your liberation or thrown into the ash can of history. Mm. You got no time now. Mm. This is the least original of the world's religions. It came into being so fast, moving to a vacuum created by the corruption of Christianity by the Romans. It had to take a few saints from Zoroastrianism, a few saints from Judaism, until it had put itself together. It's a composite religion. Right. Now, one of the reasons why we have not understood this in relationship to the whole concept of race in Europe, we have not understood now balanced civilizations. Too many times we use color when we should concentrate on culture. Okay. It matters less than a damn whether all Egyptians were pure black. All right. I have not made that claim. That is not the claim that's being made. The idea is that these were people in the main who came from the physical body of Africa. And no European would come all the way to Africa and build a civilization of this nature before they built a shoe in Europe or a house with a window. Do it, man. Come on. Come on. Move out the pyramid. We know. We know. Cool. Yeah. If the first book appeared in Europe around 1250 BC, written by someone named Homer, and we're not too clear what Homer was, man or woman. <laughs> now, that a civilization was old and in decline by then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the pyramids and the Sphinx was already there. The Hebrew entry had come and gone. So we keep on about who built the spin. People say slave built. No slaves has ever been this skillful in human history. <laughs> you can go to pyramids right now, and those blocks of stone are so close together. They've been there five thousand years. You can't even launch a playing card in the seams. They've got no bonding agent. Slaves don't have this skill. What, what, what benefit is to a slave to do a thing like this? Tell me. Now the mulattoization of Egypt began with the Hebrew entry in the 17th century, 1700 BC. It continued with the Hitzox, Shepherd King, 1600. And after this period, a thousand years of some kind of peace, and the Assyrians came, 1666, the Iranians, 550 BC. The Iranians were so bad that Africans cried out, Oh God, if you can't send me a liberator, send me a conqueror that will show mercy. Now you know what happened with the little Greek. Alexander, the so-called great, knocked at the door. <laughs> now this was the first purely European aggression. And he wasn't that aggressive because it wasn't necessary. He was to some extent a benevolent conqueror. A first-rate diplomat, second-rate warrior, but that's another lecture. <laughs> but he did open the door for the ultimate appearance of the Romans. All right, we're dealing with racism now. 
this is something we got to do. The Romans and the Greeks were smug and exclusive, but they were not racist in the present sense, although Aristotle said quite a number of things that can be interpreted as racism and might well be racism. Prejudice in itself, and preference in itself, is not racism. The racism that we are dealing with right now came out of the 15th and the 16th century. The rise of Europe after the Middle Ages, the Crusades, and the beginning of the slave trade in the 15th and the 16th century. This is what we got to really deal with. Europe, during the Crusades, partly religious, partly hustlerism, <laughs> partly a raven party. Right. But after this was over, famines, plagues, Europe had lost almost one third of its population. They're looking for an outlet. During the Crusades, they had found some things over and above anything they'd seen in Europe. Fine fabrics, beautiful designs. They brought these things back into Europe with the Africans, Arabs, and the Berbers controlling Spain from 711. They've discovered something called soul. <laughs> they began to use. <laughs> the Africans and the Arabs and the Berbers had preserved the maritime skill coming from China, the leading maritime nation of that day. Some of this information fell into the hands of Prince Henry of Portugal, called Henry the Navigator, although there's no evidence that he ever navigated anything. With the birth of European nav maritime skill, putting boats at the sea, out of the sea, Europe started looking for Asia and the sweets and spices of Asia. Something to put on that gosh down all for European food so they could eat it. <laughs> Now they wanted a rationale for what they were doing. The rationale that they were using for the Crusades now extended into the rationale for the, for the conquest of other people. Manifest destiny, divine white right. If you're not using it, it belongs to me. Come on, come on, come on. Now, the Africans and the Arabs argue among themselves and lost part of Spain. Spain and Portugal would go to the Pope to settle a dispute, 1455. The Pope would issue an edict, and he would say, <clears throat> You two good Catholic nations, stop fighting among yourselves. You're both authorized to reduce to servitude all infidel people. Now, the justification for the slave trade had been set in motion. Portugal had achieved a minor victory in the Battle of Sutra by capturing a small enclave in Morocco. Portugal had, had freed itself from the domination of the Africans and the Arabs. 1240, the Africans, then the Almoravians, had been challenged that same year by another group of uh, Islamic warriors, the Almohadis. We stand the land fools were the story of the Moors in Spain. Read John Jackson's chapter on this called Africa and the Civilizing of uh, Europe. 
because there are many good works on this uh, on this subject dealing with the uh, resurgent of uh, of Europe and the and the world. The Europeans began to come down the coast of West Africa and most of Portuguese, 1438, they began to take slaves out of Africa in 1442. The nations in inner West Africa, Ghana, Mali, Sangay, Masangay, had a golden age, not only during the slave trade, but in spite of the slave trade. And we keep missing this. We think the slave trade, nothing has happened. The great city states in West and East Africa continued until the Arabs began to destroy from the north and the Portuguese moved up from the south. Then the Portuguese and Arabs met, therefore forming the largest slave trading post in East Africa, one of the largest in the world, at Zanzibar, mostly by the Arabs from Kuwait and the Arabs from Oman, Omani Arabs and Kuwait slave trade. Now you can have something for Kuwait, and I think you might yeah. need to. But don't forget now, the Arab slave trade lasted a thousand years before the European slave trade. Oh and ask your Islamic brothers to do a little investigating on it, and if they want to read something on it, tell them, read UNESCO documents too, called Slave Trading in the Indian Ocean. And tell them also, if they want some additional material, read the Sir Harry Johnson, the uh, Colonization of Africa by Alien Races, and Sir Roger uh, Copeland's work, uh, East Africa and its Invaders, and the Cambridge History of, uh, of East Africa. And if they say that uh, all you're telling me about reading Whitey's book, you tell them that um, there's some extensive work in history that um, Get it from white or black, you haven't had time to write it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get those grants. We don't get the kind of grants we can sit down and devote three years to one right. job. We don't get that kind of money. If we get enough money at all, it might cover us for a year. And we got to go back to the classroom and get our rent paid. Uh, see, we, 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 we're very human, human beings, you know, that we can't go to the electric company and say, I'm a scholar, so I'm not paying my electric bill. <laughs> <laughs> you can put me near and say this out. My point is that now we're reaching a high point in the concept of race to justify the slave trade and the colonial system that would follow. A lot of this justification, this rationalization, is coming out of uh, out of Europe. A lot is coming out of the Catholic Church. You don't think I'm beating up on the Catholic Church because England was in a swing position between Catholicism and Protestantism. And if you think the Catholics were bad now, you wait till those English got in there. <laughs> They did it better. They were organized gangsters, I mean, this territory. I mean, they sailed up the Gambia River, took 10 miles on each part, on each side, established their trade. They made the slave trade a business, cold-blooded business. This African slave trade helping the economic rebirth of Europe. Haiti and Jamaica are one, one third of the economic uh, wealth of uh, the colonial power then coming from those two islands. They had the greatest amount of slave revolts painted because they were pinched the hard and pushed the hardest. Race was a factor now. It's becoming a kind of a justification. People that the slave preachments and slaves obey your master. That's the main thing they want him to listen to. <laughs> they destroyed his gods, now they want him to 
listen to another God. In the United States, they outlawed the drum, they outlawed any form of African fractures. They weren't quite as ruthless in the West Indies, but ruthless enough. Now we see race and color playing a major role in the expansion of Europe, in the outer world, and the recovery of Europe in the outer world. You should read Father Bartholomew D. Les Casas' little work, The Disruption of the Indies. He tells you of the impact of Columbus on this part of the world. He says from 12 to 25 million indigenous Americans were put to death. He described the encounter in Mexico. He's called the first historian of the new world. The book was so devastating, the Pope had it brought to Rome and locked the manuscript up for 200 years, nobody could read, read it. And right now, if you go to a good library and ask for it, somebody will look at you kind of strange. You should make a mission to ask for these old books. Father Bartholomew de Las Casas, The Disruption of the Indies. And read, any, read the books about Father de Las Casas. Read some of the new things on Christopher Columbus. I'm sorry that uh, uh, Michael Bradley's book, The Columbus Conspiracy, has not been published in the United States. Uh, I was promised last year that the book would be out in January. No attempt seemed to be made to get it out. This would be the ideal time to get it out. I read the book thoroughly. I enjoyed it because Chris Blum is one of my favorite anti-Western heroes. <laughs> I think one of the great fakes of history. <laughs> Even before I read Michael Bradley's book. <laughs> I re-researched him again after he gave me some new information to dig up. <laughs> There's also a book called Conquest of Paradise about Columbus. There is uh, documents on West Indian history by uh, Eric Williams. Now I'm going to close in something that has no ending anyway. One thing about the Baptist tradition, you take your text, you leave your text, you come back to it before the end and let people know, to know your text. But once you get started, it's hard to stop. <laughs> What I'm saying is that we have survived the longest Holocaust in history. That's right, that's right. And let no one say they have a monopoly on the word Holocaust. Faith has not spared us for some casual reason. Some people have been hit less than we, and they're now extinct. We need to look beyond tonight's lecture. We need to look at the racism and the expansion of Europeans to the Pacific. The wholesale murder of people in the Pacific, the destruction of people on the island of Tasmania, people in India, we need to take a holistic world view of the tremendous cost to the world for European expansion. And it wasn't necessary. I maintain that had Europe entered a genuine partnership with the people of the world, slavery wouldn't have been necessary. Racism wouldn't have been necessary. They would not have had to turn their souls 
into pretzels in order to create a rationale for that world domination. The domination of the world by any one people is rather stupid. And any one people who think they must dominate the world must be terribly insecure. It was not your bravery that brought this about. It is just fear. Yes, yes. It's lack of bravery. Then what will we do in the world of tomorrow, considering there's a billion of us on the face of the earth? We have to start producing instead of consuming everything. We must reclaim the continent of Africa, all 12 million square miles of it. We must create the kind of humanity where all men can walk in peace and walk with dignity. I didn't say forget and I didn't say forgive. Right. And I'm not advocating uh, nonviolence. Very good. I'm advocating the strategic use of violence whenever it is necessary for your self defense. All right. We have great gifts for the world. Years ago, when history was young, the great river valleys of Africa, we sent people down the Nile from inner Africa who formed a composite nation, later known to the world as Egypt. That nation and its literature laid the basis of so much that we know as the world's religion and its social thought, and so much that we now call a civilized state and humane thought. What we have to do is to form a partnership with ourselves. I say, find a mirror and look at that partner staring back at you and <laughs> say with confidence, Partner, you and I start a revolution to change the world. We choose to do it right now. All right. us a wonder That's right. to behold and a wonder of this world and telling us how to deal and how to move forward and how to go in this struggle and in this battle. I'm, I'm ready to give him another hoo hoo hoo. Right. Right. period. There are a few things that uh, Elder Brown wants me to say to you as a group. Now, this is not the only great lecture series that has been sponsored by this, our host group of people. In the past, we've had Dr. Ben Levy, Steve Coakley, Dr. Kanjufu, the late Dr. Lugman, Dr. Milton Brown, Reverend Lucas, Ivan Van Sertiman, Dr. Sertiman, Bob Law, and there have been many. Oh, yeah. Dr. Ben. Could I forget? <laughs> Joseph Ben Yakin. Okay? I don't want to forget nobody, but we've had some great lecture series in the past, and we're going to have some future great lecture series. We have two people here that's sitting up on the, on the podium that will be future speakers. And I can't go away without having said their names at least. And that's Dr. Andy Thompson and Dr. Jacob Carruthers. Yeah. So at this 
this time for us to have the question and answer period organized. We ask that those that have questions to please come and form a line up here around the uh, front, up front. Go ahead, Pop. <laughs> yeah, please, please let him come first. We want to limit your question to three seconds. The question, the answer can be a lot longer. Okay, and we're going to take the mic over for the question and answer period. But for anybody that leaves at this point, we want to thank everybody for coming and coming out to the series. And if anything comes up in the future, you if you're on our mailing list, we will be glad to notify you so you can come again. And we want to be able to thank, and we want to thank again our illustrious speakers. Okay. My question is to Mr. Bradley, wouldn't it be more scientific and more valid for you to say, as some of the other white intellectuals, a few of them, and historians and philosophers have said, or at least implied, that this aggressiveness is not something natural, this is stuff taught, it's a cultural thing, for greed and selfishness, you become superior after you have grabbed everything and then you want to justify it and you claim that I'm naturally superior. You know, the divine genetic right was based on the same thing. All groups have been greedy and selfish. The difference is the white man has been more greedy and selfish than anybody else. I have a question. What do you think about that? <laughs> I think you're wrong. I think that with regard to the white race, there's quite a bit of scientific evidence to show that they were aggressive before there was very much to be greedy about, since they were aggressive in their own caves and their own ice. I believe it goes deeper than the conception of greed. Okay, um, my question is to, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Uh, Dr. Clark and Mr. Bradley for coming out. And uh, my question is, um, I heard you say earlier racial polarization. This is to Mr. Bradley. You stated that, black, that uh, there seems to be a movement in America, you implied it, among blacks to try to racially polarize the uh, um, teachings in terms of teaching black history. For example, you stated the Afrocentrism within the school system that they're trying to imply now. We seem to be trying to racially polarize uh, history. But what I see, uh, based upon what I see when you state that, I think of uh, there's, a, there's a Sir Henry, uh, um, Gerald Massey, there's um, uh, Sir Godfrey Higgins, all these white people, the Europeans that have done history, and they've stated in their works that these things were originally uh, created and done by uh, dark-skinned people with, with, with the thick lips and woolly hair. My question to you is, doesn't it seem like the best thing we should be saying here instead of coming among black people telling us about we should not do the same thing as white people have done, which I don't believe we ever, we've never done and will do. I think it is more proper for you to go among your own people and tell them not to do that thing among us. I consider that I'm not here among black people, but I'm here among people. And I also consider that I have the right to say anything I want as long as it's the truth as I know it. And if it's not the truth, I'm happy to learn otherwise. I am trying to say as well that I've talked to some people now who carried Afrocentrism, I think, a bit further than the facts justify. At Vanderbilt, somebody told me that the high cultures of China owed everything to Africa, and that's nice, but try to convince the Chinese of that. What I'm trying to say is that the whites have distorted things terribly. I would hate to see any other group do the bad job we have, because I don't think it's necessary. That's all I have to say. Uh, oh yes. uh, the question I want to ask is this. In view of the fact, okay. Um, in view of the fact that you say the uh, 
white, uh, uh, the white people are aggressive and so forth. I don't like to think of it as aggressive, I like to think of it as uncivilized. And in that context, I'd like for you to respond in this way, uh, by telling me how long do you think it will take before white people will become civilized, and especially in view of the fact that if they came out of this cold climate uh, where they did not have access to many things, then since they did come out and they were able to share, or they had the opportunity to share, and they did not share, how long do you think it would take before they will become able to, to live in peace with the world? And if it is necessary for them to go through some sort of, I don't mean uh, education, some sort of surgery or brainery or some sort of something to make them civilized. Okay. Okay, uh, when all the speakers come up here, there is a time frame on you, okay, on the lift that you talk, okay? So let's try to limit our questions, please. Thank you. Stick up for me. I think that white people are capable of, of changing things and thinking about things more or less objectively. I think one thing that's never happened is they never had to until now. Uh, we've had multiracial societies, okay, but the white man was on top. And now we're having one in which the white man isn't on top, and so he's got to look at himself. I don't think, I, I hope, I may be wrong, but I hope that white people can actually become civilized. Gandhi once said, uh, was once asked, what do you think of Western civilization? He said, I think it would be a good idea, and I think that maybe we can achieve that. respect to Dr. Clark, uh, Mr. Bradley, I agree with the first paragraph or so of your book when you state that whites uh, are racist and aggressive and sexist and whatnot. After that, all of your proofs seem very terrible to me, Neanderthal being in the line of human evolution, um, whites' uh, propensity to uh, show sexual uh, uh, objects when they tend to cover themselves in blacks. Uh, revere fertility, but my question, my question is, how dare you try to preach to us about how to save ourselves from people like Tell it, man. Tell me. <laughs> okay, my question is to uh, Mr. Bradley. Also, um, it's related to the previous um, person who asked the question. Um, it seems from the indicated the literature I read from uh, Dr. Diop uh, and many others that the Neanderthals um, were hominids and never did um, go along the human line and that uh, the origin of Europeans can be traced back to the Cro-Magnon and that the, the Neanderthals never were human. So I'm, I want to know how do you, um, in light of the anthropological evidence that's been out, there, out here, uh, particularly since 1978, how do you account for continuing to go along with that? I'm not familiar with Dr. Diop's work in detail, but I am familiar with Neanderthals. And to me, there is no doubt whatsoever that the population of Europe still is largely Neanderthal. I've met some people from Eastern Europe and the Russia and the Caucasus Mountain who are more Neanderthal than they are anything else. They are fully human, they're just not quite modern, and they have certain, certain very definite physical attributes and emotional ones. I think that the European population now is a composite of those and other incoming people, and that I disagree with Dr. Job. Yes. Okay, my question, um, okay. You were talking about how, Af you were talking about how um, African people over here in America as slaves, African, African people over here in America as slaves uh, embracing the conqueror's religion such as uh, Christianity and Judaism and Islam. Um, one thing you didn't mention was Catholicism. And you said, okay, you, you said that we didn't add any of our Africanisms to these religions. Um, I would, my question to you is, what did you, what did you, what did you think about um, Catholicism? Because when blacks were over here, as, when blacks were slaves, 
they incorporated the Yoruba religion into Catholicism. Oh. Who are you addressing it to in actuality, I didn't say that. Now, neither one of us said that. Because while we did not take on uh, hold on to our African religion that was outlawed, um, the African practices in New Orleans to this very day, the celebrant funeral, the wake type is still in New Orleans and the African, the elements of African religions in the Caribbeans uh, to this day and parts of South America. And in my last visit to Brazil, I know Catholicism and the Yoruba faith is combined in some areas among whites as well as uh, as well as black. I did not make that kind of statement, but you might read Huskovitz's The uh, Myth of the Negro Past, and there's some other works on it too. Um, but we didn't lose, you might also read our uh, Turner's Africanisms Among the Gullah. But we did not lose everything, although uh, we're rediscovering ourselves in regards to I think the Baptist church is, uh, is an African rehash with all of its faults. It's, it's close, to, it's close to, to Africa. So we didn't, uh, didn't lose everything. We did hold on to something. Yeah, we lost, may have lost the essence, but some of the ceremonies after. <coughs> Well, my question is addressed to look, Dr. Clark, a man to whom I have great respect and I try to read everything that he uh, write and get in print. Uh, Dr. Clark, I just find it perplexing. Uh, today, as well as other recently, your characterization of the word race is artificial. And the reason I find that perplexing is because, you know, we know down through history, people have even Egyptians, as Diop pointed out, way back in some of the early dynastic period, on a column have different uh, classification or races of mankind or species of mankind. Whatever term you use, it, it stills a recognition that there are different branches, whether all those branches steal from the same stem or not. That's irrelevant from the first point of analysis. We have to deal with some type of term. And just like even in the Bible, you know, if we, we look at the table of nations, you know what I mean, whether we date that from the 10 BC or the 6 BC, it's still a recognition that there's different species or races, if you want to call it. And the reason I, I, I'm, I'm perplexed is because your uh, characterization of the term race as artificial can lead off into people and say, we as a people shouldn't band together as a group because there ain't no such thing as races. Uh, and and I'm, I'm fearful that the same thing that happened in the African community today is what happened in India in antiquity and have brought about the, 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 the plump, the, the downward plight of the blacks in India dating back from antiquity when somewhere up, down the line they lost that concept that they was a distinct people as opposed to those Aryan invaders who came in there. If you can find the word raise in the Bible, I wish you'd show it to me. I'm not for anyone losing that distinction. I'm saying nature created no race. People can combine based on religion, culture groups, environmental influences, occupations. Look, I'm a pan-African nationalist. And I, one of the reasons I don't use the word Afrocentricity is because it's a compromise with the word African. It's either African centricity or nothing. I understand what you're saying, but 
I'm somewhat of a purist in relationship to the dictionary, too. <laughs> Things must mean what they mean. Right. And I'm, I'm for our people coming together first and foremost based on a common experience, a common suffering, and a common oppressor. But if you use an artificial creation, but there are other things you can use to come together other than an artificial creation that was created to, mainly to oppress you. Look, prior to the 15th and the 16th century, nobody referred to white people as white. So to refer to people as white people, or black people, this came out of the slave trade and what it mean? You, you, you refer to people based on that geography and that culture group. Now I'm not for any breaking up of African people, a dissipation of any form of that culture. But I'm also for, for basic truth. Can I ask you a question though, Dr. Clark? Couldn't one legitimately conceive the idea of races based on a group of people that share not only a, a cultural heritage, but to a large degree a genetic one, and that came from roughly a certain geographical area? If you talk about the Africans in that sense and blacks as being a race, isn't that totally legitimate? Or if you talk about the white Europeans in that same sense, isn't that totally legitimate? Or the Mongoloids who, who, who really developed within a specific geographical area and have a genetic continuity and who also have physical differences from everybody else. I mean, what's wrong with using race in that term so long as it doesn't have any pejorative or discriminatory connotations? I don't understand, I don't understand your position. I'm not against, I'm for understanding it, but I'm saying that the word race in relation to a people was rather late. Now that you got it, you want to use it, be my guest. But the history, the semantics of it, is that it was not originally used. And people were referred to as people. Right of a given group. Now, certain things have bound people together, and for convenience, anthropologists have called this a race. So if it's, one, if it's a convenient, people want to continue to use it, I have no problem with it. But it was not originally used as a reference to a people. Nor was the word black or white or yellow used as the original you don't identify people that you identify people based on that geography right. and that culture group. Right. And then, right. My question is directed towards um, Dr. Bradley. Um, there seems to be a, a woke phenomenon that anytime a person stands up and takes a position against um, what we call racism or um, we support the dialogue to counter that, that it's considered racist. And in fact, the, the opening uh, sentence of the first chapter of your book, you say that this book is racist. So if you put forth your book, um, has it worked to counter this phenomenon that we're fighting against? Why do you consider it racist? And would you explain um, or, or define what race, what racist is as you understand it? Okay, just a second, I want to get this crystal clear. You want me to define what, what the term racist means? Okay, I use that as an opening grabber because the book was directed actually toward white people. Um, when I wrote it in 78 in Canada, there's not a very big black population in Canada, and I never really conceived an audience for it except white people, and I wanted to shock them. I consider racist to be somebody who considers that there is a prejudicial or pejorative um, reason for discriminating against somebody else on the basis of superficial characteristics. That's what racism is to me. Now in my book, I considered that we might do that with regard to white people. 
because in general speaking, history has shown they're more aggressive than other people. But I don't advocate enslaving them, or killing them off, or exterminating them, but educating them. So it is racist in the sense I'm pointing out, I think, a racial proclivity not shared to the same degree by other people. But it's not racist in the sense I don't think any violent action should be taken against white people because of it. I think that mostly, if they can be seen to experience it, that they can change to a remarkable degree. That's all. Now, does that answer your question? Because I'm not trying to duck it. Yeah. Well, because because most people, pardon? Yeah. Okay, I'll talk to you afterwards because I did it as a literary device. Okay, we see people leaving and different things like that, so I want to, I have another announcement. The audio tapes are ready and on sale now for $5. So if you want to get an audio tape, feel free to do it. Now don't rush out right now, because we're not through. We're going to take these last five questions, and then we're going to wrap up. But again, I want to say we, we do want to thank the Worldwide Wonders Deliverance Temple for the opportunity to come out and be together like this and be able to air and voice our opinions and all those good things that we need to know in order to be able to move forward as we want to do. Okay, well, these last five questions and then we want to wrap up. Okay, this is to either one. Um, I'd like to know, do you think that the majority of the world should turn against European civilization? This is so cruel and so terrible. Uh, you think the Japanese, who are moving directly towards European civilization, should reject it? You think we should get rid of our Cadillac? Uh, I think the whole world needs to turn against European values, including the European. Mm. If the European has anything called civilization that you can use, by all means use it. For your survival, draw on the intellectual heritage of the whole world, but always start with your own intellectual heritage. Right. Yes, Dr. Clark is an intellectual giant, and to see uh, Mr. Bradley on the panel with him creates for Mr. Bradley an uh, illusion of prestige that he obviously hasn't merited. But my question for you, or my statement to you, yes, Mr. Bradley, yes, you, is that you said a lot of diffusionary stuff here tonight. In particular, what I'd like to deal with uh, your references to Leonard Jeffries and what he has said about the Jews and suggesting that we not follow what he did or what may happen to us if we do. But what I like to say is, following what Dr. Clark is teaching us, that we will, we are developing a system to deal with not only our own, but for people like you, we will effectively and permanently deal with people like you. Thank you. I uh, just want to make a comment and a question that would address both of the gentlemen. But, uh, since most of the questions have gone to you, Mr. Bradley, I think this question, uh, a comment and a question. Um, yeah, first for you. Um, you made a lot of very interesting statements tonight, but one of the things that troubled me is that you failed to see the point that when you, particularly when you talked about the violent nature of other groups, World history tells me that the European taught the world how to cut each other's throat yes. in a very large way. Yes. And in particular, when you talked about, for instance, the juice killings, the girls that were killed at, you know, in the film, you have to remember that particularly if you're going to deal with the issue of the Iceman inheritance, you have to also study the, the psychological impact that has had on other people. We, as a people, have been living in physical proximity with white people for over 500 years. 
So it does not, so it does not, it's not unusual for me or for any of us here to see that many of our people have adopted the ice age tolerance level. Okay, so what I'm saying is that, that when you see black youth doing what they're doing, that is a culmination of a lot of things that has gone down. Very right. Good point. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, and that's not what I meant. What I meant was that in traditional cultures before Europe, Europe expanded, okay, there was aggression among other races and groups other than white men. Um, I just wanted to make that point. I'm not saying that everybody else was sweetness and light and the Europeans alone were nasty. However, I agree with you wholly. You cannot, I'm, I'm right now involved in this business, maybe it's not known here, but Toronto is, is right now in the middle of a controversy over, over quote, race and crime, unquote, as if you can separate race, crime, society that people have been exposed to for a long time, plus socioeconomic problems, okay? I agree with you, I mean, everybody now has been exposed to Caucasoid violence in every, conceivable way from obsolescent violence toward, you know, obsolescent production, violence toward nature, to pornography, toward violence in films. I'm, I'm not saying what you think I'm saying, I don't think. I mean, I'm not saying that just because black youths commit X amount, blacks are, you know, are, are more are criminal. Obviously not. What I'm saying is that these people have been exposed to a very violent culture for too long, and that's why I pleaded with the audience that if there's anything we can do is to stop this culture of violence. I don't know if I'm getting across now, but... Well, I'll, I'll just take it from there. I would like both of you, gentlemen, to comment on the current rise and unification of Germany and what is the rise of, these, of, the, of this particular strain, because that's, they're in the news everywhere. I mean, the skin is, the European Nazis, they are rising up, and nobody can afford to ignore that. No one can. And I'd like to hear your comments about that since you're dealing with that topic. Well, I have always maintained that the greatest danger to this country is the rise of Nazism, some form of fascism, and that the communism was never the great danger that they made it out to be that communism was the greatest danger to them to themselves. There's a rise in fear coming from the presence of two t types of minorities and the inability to put one successfully against the other, although they've had some success in this. And the realization that on a world basis and even on a national basis, very soon, whites are going to be the minority. And so people are flexing their muscles and hoping to make an impression before this is known to the victim. The unification of Germany was inevitable anyway, as the unification of Korea is inevitable. Germany might represent a threat in the world, but what not bothers me, what I find rather peculiar is that if a black person say he don't like filter fish, he's called anti-Semitic, and <laughs> Jewish defense league, and <coughs> not fighting in it, and that's 150 anti-Jewish groups in America, nobody's fighting in them. They're paramilitary, they got guns. Blacks have one dissident word. They have no guns to fight. They can't howl as people. They do too much anyway. So even if they were anti, and I don't think that's the case. Nazism is rising again in Germany, and the concept of Nazism is rising again in the United States. And no screaming editorials against it. Somebody's agreeing with it. I don't know if anybody's agreeing with it, but it's certainly on the rise. Um, 
I went out uh, uh, in Canada, it's on the rise quite a bit too. I was hired just recently to go across a Canada by bus with a group of skinheads undercover to get their values and whatnot. A, a, a film producer wanted to do a, a film about this new phenomenon arising. And it was frightening to me, number one, how many people there are. Because in every little town we stopped at, much, much smaller than, than yours, mostly down here, these guys were almost met, almost uh, uncannily, you might say. People were coming out of the woodwork, hundreds of people, and little stop like Medicine Hat, Alberta, or uh, Brandon, Manitoba. And I was, the first thing that struck me was the, the violence and anger of these people. And the next thing that struck me was how many of them there were. And I've been sitting in Toronto trying to convince Canadian media to do something about this, and I've gotten nowhere because nobody will take me seriously. But I think it's a very serious problem. I think within five or ten years, we may be in, in trouble that's going to make Nazi Germany like a Sunday school picnic. Um, give thanks to uh, Brother Clark and Mr. Bradley. It's always a pleasure to have uh, Brother Clark in the midst. Uh, your spirit is so enormous that you know it, it lifts my my question, uh, Dr. Clark, is you raised uh, a point in the lecture that we shouldn't be concerned with the color, but we should be more concerned with culture, and you cannot be more right than that, because a lot of us forget that um, the first people to enslave us were not the Europeans, but were the Arabs, and a lot of Arabs look just like Africans in, in color, not necessarily in culture. So I'd like for you to you know, elaborate on how do you define racism and why are we having so much violence amongst ourselves? Is it a problem or a, uh, a strategy that the Europeans are using to eliminate our people? Unfortunately and tragically, sometimes we have a lot of violence among ourselves because we have not mustered up the will and the technique and the nerve to take on our real enemy that is not ourselves. Thank you. Uh, the Arab is a mixture. I've often referred to the Arab as the bastard child of a bastard child. Human ways matter dealing with the mixture of several people. And of course, they were in the slave trade. After two generations of mixing with African women, they created kind of a dark-skinned Arab that they used to facilitate the East African slave trade. Um, we don't know how few friends we've had in this world. We might have not have had any. But every person we've ever befriended, in most cases, have turned on us ultimately. What we need to do is to be friend and defender of ourselves. Be careful about who we befriend. Defenders of ourselves. We, I think we put confidence in the wrong people and we bought too many foreign toys and foreign religions and foreign ideals without examining them thoroughly. I don't think the Arab is basically different from the European. I think we talked a situation as far as we can tonight. Okay, Mr. Bradley, um, how is your book received? And I also have a question for Dr. Clark. And Dr. Clark, you spoke about religion and uh, how religion has been used to control people. The spirituality that you spoke of, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about that? More detail? With man before man organized religion, and he had no, no rationalization. When Africans adhere to spirituality other than religion, he tried to bring man in harmony with nature. 
With religion, you try to defy nature. Right. And Africans believe that, that there was a spiritual force in the universe. He knew that he couldn't make a hurricane, he couldn't stop one. He knew that the spiritual force of the universe was in everything, including the tree. So he didn't have to go to a church and pray because whoever was the God it was, it was in every living thing. And the tree and the water. And in himself. And when the Europeans came and built something called this a church, called this the house of the Lord, the African laughed at him because they said that the spiritual force they can make to win and bring back the seasons, too large to fit into that small place. You can't must be <laughs> So the what you what you what you're worshiping is not a religion at all. You worship a, a foreigner's concept of a religion. And you need not feel guilty when you neglect it or walk away from it. Oh, that's right, that's right, yeah. Okay, uh, it's not very well received among whites, except among some physical anthropologists. It's uh, better received, I suppose, among non-whites, both Orientals and Bloods, but some, like the young man who left here, seems to be angry at me for some reason. I still don't know what I've done. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, it, it depends, but naturally you don't expect whites to like it very much. In Canada, I have a very good, difficult time anybody even taking it seriously enough to interview me, except if they want to distort it. Then they're happy to interview me. But you have to expect all that. All right, thank you. I must apologize for extending your time past your minute. Uh, but I felt that the discussion did not touch on several important points about genetics and paleoanthropology that could be brought out and shed some light on it. Uh, dealing with the theory of orthogenesis, first of all, uh, what Dr. Clark was speaking about, the fact that the African man saw himself in context with everything in existence. This meant that the cosmos and the infinitesimal and all things he was a part of that, and he had to define himself as a part of that. This uh, relates to orthogenesis in that the seed that flows from generation to generation has a direction of its own. It has a direction that you could say is of God. And there is such a thing as a dead end in mutational process. The white race is in the process of a dead end. Genetically, they are not able to reproduce at the same level as other peoples. And this has been substantiated by their own studies. It has got down to the place to where they even masturbate to reproduce through artificial insemination and other scientific devices. Uh, I want to point out that Nazism came about as a result of Oswald Spangler's studies back in the early 1800s. And it was Hitler who read his studies and formulated Mein Kampf while he was in jail. From this position, it was said that the only way the white race could be saved was through certain devices that Hitler adopted. One of them is the uh, elimination of people, non-productive people. Another way was through the arts which Spangler said that the arts had shown that the European race was destructing, uh, self-destructing. Now, it was Richard Nixon who came into order, came into power with the Nazism in 1968 after the white race was uh, shocked by the riots. And from that, I'm, I'm, I'll wrap it up, but from that, we have been under an intensive Nazi national policy ever since. And that policy is uh, in its last stages today. So all the people out here that run things, and even here in Chicago, the Jew, there's a Jew in charge of the Nazi party. So this is a whole 
uh, process that black people with the state government and every area of society that we look at, we are looking at Nazi policy. And you can read your mind, come and find that out. Thank you. The germ of Nazism, totalitarianism, is so firm in the mind of the European is that you could not expect the defeat of Hitler and Germany to wipe it out because before Hitler came to power, other people were advocating the same thing. The Teutonic's origins theory had its greatest development at Columbia University and Harvard University by professors there. At the same time, the racial theory is the wind for Sauter, who wrote the Rising Tide of Color, and another work called The Negro as a Beast in the Eye of the Image of God. And you haven't read the tremendous amount of racist literature produced in this country, and they said things worse than Hitler ever said. I don't know what everybody's so surprised about it. You ever read David Hume and all these people who justified slavery? I mean, hundreds of years before Hitler was born. And yeah. So it's, it's, it's nothing especially new, but you, you are newly discovering something that's been there all along. We don't watch ourselves. This country, I thought, had Nixon not moved to Watergate, I think Nixon might have been uh, a dictator. Might have eliminated the election, became America's first dictator. We're rather naive people in relationship, but we, we'd rather have elect an intelligent president anyway. <laughs> I think we need to be a little more alert, read more, think more, we need more study groups. Yes. Yeah. Be more protective of our community. Yeah. We need to wipe out all this degeneracy in our community. Crack and crack them more. Crack some head. And <laughs> crack. everyone for coming out and the worldwide one deliverance temple has been our host tonight and we haven't seen elder nelson brown if he's around wave your hands so everybody know who you are here he comes up so let's give this program a, a great big round of applause we thank dr clark and michael bradley and as they say be careful out there <laughs> <laughs> 